With the impending release of Disney's live-action version of Mulan, one question looms largest on the internet. Will there be Szechuan sauce? In 1998, they had this promotion for the Disney film Mulan, where they where they, they, they created a new sauce for the McNuggets called Szechuan Sauce, and it's delicious! With that one clip from Rick and Morty, McDonald's special limited edition nugget sauce released to tie in with the original Mulan movie became the sauce that was heard around the world. And after that clip, the company did do a limited re-release of the fabled Szechuan Sauce, causing some badly behaved Rick and Morty fans to low-key riot. But now, here we are, on the cusp of a new Mulan movie and a second chance for the world to experience that liquid gold yet again. Make it happen, McDonald's! Hashtag bring back the sauce! I want to try this stuff, and I refuse to drop 14 grand in the Szechuan sauce eBay black market. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show where our reflection shows the intense overanalysis and mild anxiety of who I am inside. It's no secret that I've been excited about the live-action Disney remakes each and every time they come out. And sure, sometimes you can't really recreate the magic of a beloved childhood classic no matter how much Beyoncé you rub onto it. But if my hopes are high for one of these remakes, honestly, they're probably highest for Mulan. For one, Mulan isn't gonna have to revolve around CGI animals that somehow feel less realistic than the two-dimensional drawings that they're based on. But I also feel like Mulan is the forgotten youngest child in Disney's really strong stretch of movies from the 90s. Oh, Mulan, you made the soccer team. Good for you, that's nice. Meanwhile, your older siblings Aladdin, Lion King, and Beauty and the Beast all got full scholarships, were named Homecoming Queen, and got the Oscar for Best Original Song, but you know, we're proud of you too, though. We love you all equally. The original Mulan, though, deserves some respect. I mean, nobody doesn't sing along when I'll Make a Man Out of You comes on a karaoke, and Mushu belongs in the canon of great animated sidekicks. I mean, when you think about it, isn't Mushu basically just Donkey from Shrek in dragon form, all the way down to Eddie Murphy? Hold on a second. A movie about a protagonist reluctantly going on a journey to save their home, hiding their true identity from their love interest, all while accompanied by an Eddie Murphy voiced sidekick? Is Mulan actually the first Shrek movie? No, no it's not. At any rate, Mulan also gives us one of the best action sequences ever from a Disney movie, when Mulan fires a rocket at a mountain to create an avalanche and bury the invading Huns, who historically would have been Mongols because of history, but who's keeping track of that stuff? It's a cool piece of Disney meeting MacGyver, and it's one of the most epic moments in all of Disney films. It's also one of the deadliest moments that we've seen in a Disney film as we calculated in a past theory. But now that we're on the cusp of this new movie, it makes the theorist in me wonder, how realistic was that scene? Could you really cause an avalanche with a giant Roman candle, and could Mulan have done so hundreds of years ago when the film took place? It's gonna take research searching a number of questions from history and physics to get to the bottom of it. So let's get down to business, and we'll make some puns. To figure out just how realistic this whole scene is, we've got to answer a number of initial questions. Question number one, can a small explosion create an avalanche? We've all heard that if you're mountain climbing, you shouldn't scream for fear of causing an avalanche, but that's not really a thing. No joke, it's a complete myth. Sure, your voice may be powerful, and yeah, it may echo off of the mountaintops, maybe, but your voice alone simply doesn't have enough force. Scientifically speaking, the pressure amplitudes caused by shouting are about two orders of magnitude smaller than the amount it takes to set an avalanche off, which then merits the question, what can cause an avalanche? Well, an avalanche is a lot more complex than just a bit of snow sliding down into more bits of snow. Believe it or not, there are actually three different types of avalanches. Dry snow, wet snow, and slab. For each one, it's as much about having the right conditions for an avalanche as anything else. You need a steep mountain slope, you need snow cover, a weak layer in that snow cover, and finally a trigger. Now, a dry snow avalanche, or powder avalanche, occurs after fresh snowfall. These tend to travel very fast, up to 190 miles an hour. That's about 300 kilometers an hour. These things start all light and fluffy and are very visually beautiful, but beneath that misty powder cloud is a rushing mass of snow that, when it comes to a stop, is about four times denser than when it started. Meanwhile, a wet snow avalanche is caused by the snow strength decreasing from either melting or rainfall. Because everything is so moist in the snow, there's no pillowy cloud with this one, making everything look much more like a landslide. It also makes wet snow avalanches much slower, about 10 to 20 miles an hour or 15 to 30 kilometers an hour. But both of these two types of avalanches 
pale in comparison to the third type, slab avalanches, which account for about 90% of all avalanche-related deaths. Basically, you have yourself a solid slab of snow resting on a less stable layer of snow underneath it, and when that weak layer fails, the top slab slides, taking everything with it. And when I say taking everything, I mean it. A typical slab is about half the size of a football field, and about one or two feet deep, 30 to 60 centimeters. They start off slow, but they can quickly accelerate to around 80 miles an hour, or 128 kilometers an hour in just a few seconds. So basically a giant sheet of snow and ice heads straight down a mountain at 80 miles per hour. With all that being said, the avalanche that we see in Mulan is absolutely a slab-style avalanche. So what can trigger an avalanche? Well, it can really be any number of things from earthquakes to wind to snowmobiles. If it can disturb the snowpack enough to loosen that top layer of snow, gravity is just going to do the rest. Assuming that all the other conditions are right, could an exploding rocket act as a trigger? Well, yeah, they do, frequently. Small controlled explosions are often used to cause small periodic avalanches in order to reduce the likelihood of giant catastrophic avalanches. So, much like controlled burns are vital to preventing huge forest fires, little man-made avalanches keep skiers from becoming human popsicles. The explosion that we see when Mulan's projectile hits the top of the mountain doesn't have to be gigantic, it just has to disrupt the snow enough to cause a snowball effect. So, it's safe to say that the answer to question one is a yes. Question number two, can an avalanche actually take out an army? The short answer is yes, and we have history to prove it. During World War I, Austro-Hungarian troops built barracks and fortifications in the Italian Alps, settling them at high altitudes in the hopes of being out of range of mortar fire. But as it turns out, mortars shouldn't have been the biggest of their concerns, as the barracks were buried by a series of avalanches in December of 1916, with the largest of those coming on what is now known as White Friday. These avalanches brought massive casualties both to the Austro-Hungarians as well as the Italians, with total estimates of life lost that day anywhere between 2,000 and 10,000 people. So avalanches definitely have the power to decimate an army, but these troops were mostly standing still. In Mulan, Shun Yu's army is charging on horseback toward the Chinese when they're swept up by the avalanche. So would the cavalry charge have simply outrun the avalanche? If you're paying attention, you know the answer is no. At their fastest, most cavalry charges top out at 10 meters a second, which translates to about 22 miles per hour. Sure, horses can go faster than that, but given that the not technically Hun army is charging through the snow, it's probably safer to say that they weren't going faster than 22 miles an hour. Avalanches, on the other hand, can easily reach speeds of 80 plus miles an hour, so turning around or getting out of the way isn't going to be in the cards for the Huns. The avalanche that we see in Mulan is going to catch up to those troops, and it's likely going to devastate their entire force. So the answer to question number two, we can definitely say again that it's realistic. But okay, okay, avalanches are dangerous and they're not that hard to cause. Big whoop, says you, the disgruntled viewer who just tuned in for the discussion of Chinese rocket artillery. The real question is number three, whether Mulan could have hit the summit of the mountain with a rocket to cause that avalanche in the first place. This is the question that gets the most complicated because it requires us to make some decisions about the world in which Mulan exists. For one thing, when exactly is Mulan set? The kind of weaponry she would have used is highly dependent on the era, but the movie gives us some mixed messages. The original legend of Hua Mulan placed her life in the 5th or 6th century AD during the Northern Wei period of Chinese history, but the Huns weren't around at this point at all in history. To make things even more confusing, the depiction of the Great Wall of China in Mulan looks like the parts of the wall that were built during the Ming Dynasty from the 14th to the 17th century AD. But the kicker for me here is the existence of the imperial city in the first place, which was also built during that Ming Dynasty. So for the sake of argument, let's just say that Disney's version of the Mulan story takes place in a later medieval China, no earlier than the 14th century. In that case, Case, the rocket that we see Mulan fire at the mountain would have been historically accurate for that time period. The first recorded use of rocket weapons by the Chinese occurred against the Mongols at the Battle of Kai Kang in 1232 AD. The artillery in this battle were known as fire arrows, which were basically small explosives attached to arrows that helped them fly straight before they exploded on impact. Basically, they were the equivalent of bottle rockets. But what we see in the battle scene of Mulan is something much larger and a whole lot more complex. The most likely inspiration for Mulan's rocket launcher was a device called the, and apologies for butchering the pronunciation, Huolong Shu Shui, which translates to fire dragon issuing from the water. The Huolong Shu Shui was one of history's first examples of a multi-stage rocket, where an initial fuse was lit to propel small rockets, which would then in turn fire the larger rocket when the fuse is burned out. It's pretty darn sophisticated technology given that the world was still several centuries away from electricity and indoor plumbing. An estimated range of the Huolong Shu Shui was a pretty impressive 1800 yards, slightly over a mile. 
So it's definitely a long range weapon, but is it long range enough to hit the mountaintop that Mulan is aiming for? To answer that, we need to determine where exactly in the world we are, and that's where things start to get a little messy. Everyone in Mulan refers to the battle site as the Tung Shao Pass, which would make things easy if Tung Shao Pass actually existed. Nor is there a super obvious mountain pass between the Great Wall and Beijing that would be the real world stand in for Tung Shao Pass. However, Disney's production team did travel to several places in China while researching for the film, and one of those locations was Luoyang, very close to Hulao Pass near Mount Song. This is the likeliest culprit of our inspiration for Tung Shao Pass because Luo Pass is the location of a few different battles from Chinese history, including one concurrent with the original Hua Mulan story. So let's assume assume that the real life version of the mountain pass we see in Mulan is around Mount Song, which at its peak has a height of 4,961 feet or 1512 meters. As we just mentioned, the Huolong Shu Shui had an approximate range of 1,800 yards, which is 5,400 feet or 1,645 meters. Now granted, Mulan isn't firing the rocket straight up, and Pythagoras would be quick to tell us that the measurement that we're looking for is the hypotenuse of a right triangle that takes both the lateral and vertical distance into account. So if we take a look at the angle at which Mulan is launching the rocket, we get a launch angle of right around 45 degrees. That means that if the total range of the rocket is 5,400 feet, the rocket could travel both a horizontal distance and a vertical distance of about 3,818 feet or 1,164 meters. That isn't quite high enough to hit the summit of Mount Song from ground level, but remember, Mulan isn't at the base of the mountain. She's already pretty close to the top of the cliff. As long as they're already about 1,000 feet up the mountain, which appears likely based on the treacherous steep cliffs below, then Mulan's rocket absolutely has the range it needs to hit the sweet spot and cause that avalanche. So on today's episode of Mythbusters, uh, film theory, we can say that Mulan's artillery is sufficient to cause a potential avalanche, that it's historically accurate for the Chinese military to be using that device, and that the outcome of the avalanche would be just as devastating as we see in the film. It requires some estimation, but the scene strikes me as plausible all the way through, as long as Mulan is just a crazy good sniper. But here's the real twist of today's episode, my friends. Even if Mulan didn't hit that mountain with the rocket, there's still a good chance that the not Huns were gonna die in an avalanche anyway. You see, National Geographic estimates that 90% of avalanche disasters are triggered by humans, whether they be climbing, skiing, or snowmobiling. And if those are enough to cause an avalanche, how about a cavalry charge made up of hundreds of stampeding horses? I mean, we just talked about the various triggers an avalanche needs, including small explosions, disruptions in the snow, or earthquakes. And something about hundreds of horses thundering down a mountain all at the same time suggests that there might just be enough force there to cause a chain reaction, provided the other conditions that we mentioned before are there, snow cover steep slopes and weakened layers in the snowpack, it doesn't really matter if the trigger was an exploding rocket or a charging army. Mulan made a great shot for sure, but Shan Yu's army was doomed as soon as they decided to go through the mountains in the first place. The quickest way to the Emperor is through that pass. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. Now if you'll excuse me, since Mulan just got delayed, I guess I have to settle with rocking out to some I'll make a man out of you. Oh, you're wondering what earbuds I'm using that are giving me such tremendous sound? Well, glad you asked. These are actually my new Raycon wireless earbuds, our sponsor for today's episode. Buying a pair of Raycon headphones is serious big brain time. Not only are they half the price of any other premium wireless earbud out there, which, I gotta be honest, is nice for a guy who is constantly losing small important objects now that they're being tossed around the house and restaurants and literally everywhere by a toddler, but they also deliver a great depth of sound with their latest, the every everyday E25 having a lot more bass. Again, nice when the aforementioned toddler wants to listen to Baby Shark for like the 17th time in a row and you just want to listen to some daddy music for a change just for like three minutes. Well, you pop in your Raycon wireless earbuds and finally listen to something that is slightly more melodically complex. Sorry, can you tell that I'm speaking from personal experience right now? Please, can someone relate to this? Please tell me that I'm not alone. Anyway, not only is Raycon helping me save money and my sanity, they're actually a shape that fits and stays in your ear able to stay in there regardless of whether you're walking, you're running, or, you know, contorting your body around as your toddler spider monkeys around your head. They're super easy to pair too, but more importantly, they stay paired, which is like the most obnoxious thing ever for other Bluetooth devices. Like, why are you dropping the connection? Nothing has changed and I'm in the middle of my song. They also come in a lot of great colors and they give you six hours of playtime per charge. 
So if you're looking for an excellent set of wireless earbuds that aren't gonna set you back worse than your student loans, and I know you are since most phones don't have an audio jack anymore, Raycon is the way to go. Plus, if you click the link in the description, buyraycon.com slash film theorists, you get 15% off your order, making that low price even better. That's buyraycon.com slash film theorists. Just click the link in the description. It's easier than trying to spell out film theorists. F-I-L-M-T-H-E-O-R-I-S-T-S. It's even hard to say. Anyway, the long and short of it is that they're mini earbuds delivering some huge sound and even bigger savings. So click that link down in the description below, buyraycon.com slash film theorists to get 15% off your order. And in the meantime, remember, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut.